online. We are sorry for the delay. We've had serious network issues. We're, we can't even use our Mevo. We're having to switch over to a phone, and um, but we're we're here. So let's jump right in. We're 15 minutes late. I'm sorry, and uh, excuse the glare on my glasses. Uh, we are uh, working out the best we can here, and uh, but it'll still be good. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. A to the men. All right. <coughs> we're talking about the study of uh, salvation, and we were talking about the um, practical values of the doctrines of the ascension and glorification of Christ last week, and we finished that up, and now we're talking about the application of the provisions of the resurrection and glorification of Jesus. And the first thing we're going to talk about, and what I always like to talk about tonight is uh, election, uh, the doctrine or the uh, teaching of election, and so uh, which is one of the most controversial um, topics in all of theology uh, is election. Uh, that through the centuries, the Christians divided into various camps. Uh, there, are, there are even books on systematic theology that don't even cover the subject of election because of the controversy of it. Um, so uh, it has been presented, election has been presented in, um, in, in some cases to such an extreme um, manner that it makes it sound like that those who are elected will be saved, uh, sir, certainly to be saved regardless of their response to the gospel, their manner of living. And then contrarily, there are those who are chosen to be lost or said to be perished eternally regardless of any endeavor to come to God through Come to God through faith in Christ. So, um, these these are extreme. This is the extreme position. Uh, this position, this extreme position of uh, election, um, is called um, the doctrine of unconditional election. This goes means that the elect are chosen completely apart from any repentance and faith on their part, and limited atonement. That means that Christ did not die for all men. <coughs> Excuse me, but only for those whom he chose. <clears throat> it is mankind, uh, but only for those he chose. It is also based on the teaching that God's general call to all men um, is not a sincere call uh, that he only efficiently calls. That means intending to bring to pass. Those he intended to bring is the ones he called. Those who he previously elected for salvation. And those who he pre, uh, the, and those people um, were the ones to be called. It has been shown through Scripture and the, the or, and our early teaching on the death of Christ that he died. He did die for all mankind, and that he bids all of us uh, who labor and are heavy laden to come unto him. Hallelujah! So the extreme position of grace, I mean, not of grace, but of election, is. Uh, is, is really, is, it's wrong. It, it is scripturally unsound. Um, so what is biblical election? Theism, the theologian, says in this redemptive sense, election is, and it's a nice little definition, this is what Theism says, the sovereign act of God in grace, whereby he chose in Christ Jesus for salvation, all those whom he foreknew would accept him. That key word, foreknew, foreknowledge. See, there are, what happens with people who, who in an election is, uh, who have extreme, they go find all the scriptures on God's elect, those and so forth, and leave out anything else and build a doctrine and leave out this one scripture, this one that talks about the foreknowledge of God. For whom he did foreknow, he did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his dear son. That is the key word to the whole thing. You see, when we understand that God foreknew and then he elected, it's not a thing where God says, you're going to be saved and you're not going to be saved and there's nothing you can do about it. Okay? It is a matter of those he knew, he elected and called them to be conformed to the image. So, let's say that again. Great election is that sovereign act of God. So it is a sovereign act of God. And we'll explain that in a minute. Hallelujah. In grace, 
So grace is involved in the sovereign act of God, whereby he chose in Christ Jesus for salvation all those he foreknew would accept him. Um, election is a sovereign act of God. So let's talk about the sovereign act of God. Why is it a sovereign act of God? <coughs> um, he does not have to consult. Listen, God does not have to consult with or ask the opinion of anyone else. He, he's, he's sovereign. He can do that. He can do it without the input from anyone else. Um, Inasmuch as the scripture teaches that election took place before the foundation of the world, Ephesians 1 and 4, there was none with whom God could consult. All men have sinned, and um, we are all guilty before God. So he's not under any obligation whatsoever to provide salvation for any. So sovereign act, he did it without any consultation, and without any requirement, without being forced by anyone else to do it. <coughs> so, number one, it is a sovereign act. It's a sovereign act, okay? Secondly, it is an act of grace. And for the same, and it's almost the same reason, all mankind has sinned and deserves nothing but condemnation. There is, mankind deserves nothing. He did not deserve redemption. He did not have the right to redemption. He couldn't go to God and demand that God redeem him. Man did not have that. Um, but God in grace decided to do it. Hallelujah. Okay. Um, sinful man could of himself where, uh, do nothing he, 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 um, where he could be considered worthy of salvation. Thus, any offer of eternal life must be on the basis of grace. Hallelujah. And then thirdly, it is in Christ Jesus because he alone could provide the righteousness which man needed. God could not choose man in himself, so he chose in Christ. And remember, there is one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. It's not, it's not denying the deity, but as we said earlier in our teaching, uh, as we've been teaching on theology and so forth, that one... Uh, Jesus was 100% God and 100% man, man once he became incarnate, once he took on flesh. He existed in both realms as God, but as a man. And he went to the Christ, went to the cross as a substitute, a sinless man, redeeming mankind. And so in that case, he becomes the mediator, the man Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. So praise God. So it is the sovereign act of God, it is in grace, and it is in Christ Jesus. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Gra election, as we said earlier, is, always has to be understood within the concept and, and construct of foreknowledge. Romans 8, 28 through 30 says this, We know all things work together for them that love God, those who are called according to his purpose, for whom he did foreknow. He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn of many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, he did call. Whom he called, he justified. Whom he justified, he also glorified. Hallelujah. Praise God. But notice that the beginning of all the predestinate, conform, um, uh, call, justified, glorified, the head of all that, before any of that took place, was for whom he did foreknow. He also did predestinate. It began that chain. The foreknowledge began the events of election. Foreknowledge began the events of election. The foreknowledge of what? That God knew who would and who would not accept Jesus Christ. Because he knows all things. Now, was God unjust to you know, uh, know that people are not going to accept him? And, you know, they go to hell. No, he gives them the opportunity. He, he's made the call to all. Salvation is for all. Any Whosoever believeth is to all who but believe. Hallelujah. But he also knows who will receive it and who won't. Yet he still, Jesus, even in the knowledge that people would reject the work of God through Jesus Christ, 
The Bible says when John the Baptist saw Jesus coming, behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. He came to pay the price for all men, even those who would reject him. It's just that God, in his foreknowledge, then elected those he knew would receive him. Hallelujah. Praise God. Okay. So, now Peter, as an apostle of God, let's, let's, let's read 1 Peter 1, 1 and 2. Um, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to the strangers throughout uh, Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, uh, Asia, Bithynia, elect, 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 according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father. I'm going to read it one more time. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father. Through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Hallelujah. You know, um, in, in, in Baptist circles, you got the old primitive Baptists, and, and, mo and uh, most of them were, were hardcore election. You know, um, there's nothing you could do without you to save you, nothing you could do to, to, not, to get saved, nothing you could do to not be saved. Uh, and then you have the free will Baptists. See, Baptists believe in free The free will believe that you had a free will to accept or reject. And it was up to your free will, not to an election. Okay? Um, and so, but here, Peter, it says here in 1 Peter 1, 1 and 2, that we were elect according to the foreknowledge of God. Let's, um, we, we got to clearly distinguish. Now, let me say something. Make it clearly and, and define so we don't misinterpret terms. Distinguish between God's foreknowledge and God foreordaining. There is a difference between the foreknowledge and foreordaining, okay? Uh, it's not right to say that God foreknew all things because he arbitrarily determined to bring them to pass. See, foreordaining would mean, <coughs> excuse me, God had a foreknowledge of something because he had already purposed to happen that way. That means foreordaining took place before knowledge. Uh, took place before foreknowledge. Drink a little lemon uh, flavor there. Kind of like Perry A. Water, just cheaper. <laughs> Hallelujah. Um, God, so, so let's say, let me say this. Foreknowledge and his foreordaining, it is not right to say that God foreknew all things because he arbitrarily determined, arbitrarily, that's what some people will try to teach, that God just went kind of going, oh, you're, you're saved, you're going to hell, you're saved, you're going to hell, you're saved, you're going to hell. Nothing y'all can do about it, just go to live. Because if you're going to be saved, you're going to be saved, nothing you can stop it. If you're going to hell, you're going to hell, nothing you can stop it. That's just the way it is. You see, that is extreme election. <coughs> um, or really extreme Calvinism. Okay? Um, but let's look, say it, look at it this way. God, in his foreknowledge, looks ahead to events much as, as much as we look back on them. Foreknowledge no more changes the nature of future events than after knowledge can change a historical fact. Okay? Foreknowledge no more changes the nature of future events than um, after knowledge can change a historical fact. Kind of like uh, if you're a Star Trek, you know, like watching Star Trek, and they would go into the future, and they can't mess with this, the, the time continuum because you would mess up history, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, kind of getting a little sci-fi there. But the truth of the matter is, God knowing what's going to take place does not change, okay, that it was going to take place. He's not changing it. He simply, because of that, determined to predestinate people to live certain ways or have certain callings, certain gifts, to be elect. Glory to God. There is a di difference between what God determines to bring to pass and what he merely permits to happen. Okay? Fezen, again, our, our theologian that we, we quote often, um, states this, certainly only few have hold the view of unconditional election. 
would teach that God is an efficient cause of sin. And I've heard people say, God made them a prostitute. God made them a, you know, a, a drug addict. God made them this. And there's nothing they can do about this. He made them that way. Um, that would make him the author of the sin. Practically, everyone would agree that God merely permitted sin to enter the universe and that all would all that he foresaw that it um, and, and all would admit that he foresaw that it would enter because he created anything before he created anything. I'm, I'm trying, I'm getting mixed up here. Let me, let me go back and start over. Certainly only a few hold the view of unconditional election. We teach that God is the efficient cause of sin. God merely permitted sin to enter the universe. And all would admit that he foresaw that it would enter before he created anything. If then God could foresee that sin would enter the universe without efficiently decreeing that it should enter, then he can also foresee how men would act without efficiently decreeing how they shall act. Okay, now that gets, you know, they're talking about little older theologians and, and they get kind of uh, whatever with the terminology. Basically saying, just because God saw that sin was going to enter, did that mean he ordained it to enter? It was in his plan. He had already had a plan and he set course in his, you know, uh, the plan. But because he saw it, he already set another plan. Behold the Lamb of God slain before the foundations of the world. Okay? Okay? Jesus was the Lamb of God that was slain before the foundations of the world. Ephesians 1, 3 through 5 makes it very clear that believers were chosen in Christ Jesus. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, and see, that's not that we were that, that he predestined us, he foreknew us. Okay? That we should be holy without blame before him in love, having predestined us to the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. Now, if I read to you that we are elect according to the foreknowledge of God. So you come read this scripture, and you got a you got a viewpoint of uncond you know unconditional election that God's produced it, and you read this scripture without the others. Wow, those who got saved were chosen before the world. They're saying nothing. No, 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 no. You have to read all of the Bible. You have to take all of it into account. Have all of it as part of what you're you're studying and looking at. Hallelujah. Look um, at this. It says, "Having chosen us His own in Christ." God was not looking at, at man in himself, but as he is in Christ. See, we were chosen because we were in Christ. Those who accepted Jesus, because Jesus was uh, foreordained before the uh, foundation of the world to take away the sin, he saw who would receive him. Then we are um, chosen with him because God foresaw or foreknew that we would accept Christ. And so we were chosen with him before the foundation of the world. Okay? That's solely based on foreknowledge. Those who were chosen are those who were in Christ. By this foreknowledge, God already saw them, them that were to make the choice. Those who are in Christ are, uh, are sinners who have believed in the redeeming blood of Christ through which they've been united with him as members of his body or really former sinners you know, you know, people who were sinners, but through the redeem, through believing in Jesus and accepting Jesus through His redeeming blood, um, we've been united with Him as members of His body. Hallelujah! There is no virtue whatsoever, uh, whatever, in this faith. Men are not saved because they believe, but through believing. The act of faith is the act of believing what he did. Faith is not the, the, the um, how can we say this you know, another way? You're not just saying because you believe. It's, an, it's the action of believing in what Jesus did. 
and what he did, the faith of believing what he did. You know, the faith didn't save you in the sense that you're saved because of faith. Now, that don't, I know we did a lot of teaching on the other side of faith. You're not saved because of the, uh, of the faith itself. You're saved through faith, the action of faith working in believing that Jesus did what he did and that you received him, okay? Glory to God. Believers were foreseen by God in Christ when they chose, when he chose them. How did they get there? Through faith in his dear son. He did not determine who should be there. No, here we go. God did not determine who should be there. He simply saw them there in Christ when he chose them. Okay? They were in Christ when he made the decision to make them elect, predestinated, chose. Okay? Now here, let's, let's kind of get to uh, maybe another terminology that may help us understand this more clearly. The Bible does not teach selection, but election. Okay? Selection. And that is that kind of random, I choose, the, I, I select this one, I select that one, I select that one, I reject this one, I reject that one, I reject this one. Okay? Um, so it, the Bible does not teach selection. It does teach election. Nowhere does the Bible teach that there are some who are predestined to be damned. This would be unnecessary in as much as all sin sinners are already on their way to eternal condemnation. Okay? So God would have to choose. Well, I just decided you're going to hell. He didn't have to do that. Everybody that's out there who doesn't receive Jesus is going to hell. So God didn't have to go out here and select the ones that go to hell and the ones that go to heaven. He made salvation available to all man, all mankind who chooses to accept Jesus Christ through the act of believing in his redemptive work. Remember, okay? The sovereign act by grace in Christ to believe. By grace you say through faith that not of yourselves it is the gift of God. Okay? Um, Ephesians 2, 1, verses 1 through 3, and then verse 12. And you have he quickened. That means that's old King Jimmy from Maybe Life. Who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. That spirit, or the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had. Our conversation, our conversation is old Elizabethan English for a manner of life, our lifestyle, the way we live, the way we conduct ourselves, okay? In time past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Verse 12, at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise having no hope and without God in the world. Okay? <clears throat> so God does not teach selection. The Bible doesn't teach selection, but it teaches election. And election, again, is based on foreknowledge. It is not man's non-election that leads to his ruin. Okay? It is a sin. And failure to accept Jesus Christ. Every man is free to accept Christ as his personal Savior if he wills or wants to. Not only is he invited, that who, you know, whosoever believeth, go preach the gospel to every creature, whosoever believeth, whosoever believeth, whosoever. He didn't say there's an elect bunch are going to believe this. You know, them, you know, he said, whosoever, okay, whosoever believeth shall be saved. Glory to God. Um, not only is he invited, he's urged to be invited. Christ has made every provision for him. Um, Hebrews 2, 9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory, <coughs> excuse me, and honor that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. 
Acts 17, 30, the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Hallelujah. Okay. Now, there's been a lot of problems that have risen um, in the church over the doctrine of election um, because some tried to apply it to the unsaved. It is truth for those who are already in Christ. It is universal. That's written, now, that's just recognized universally. Within the body of believers um, that, the Paul, that, that the Paul wrote to in Romans, the body of believers that were in Rome, um, Let's see here. Yeah. It's most orderly set forth. He sets forth the plan of salvation that we have in the Bible. It will be noticed that the Apostle Paul does not deal with the subject of election until he passed the eighth chapter of Romans, which concludes with the truth of no separation from Christ. From this, uh, I believe that neither life nor death, nor principality, nor power, nor things present, nor things to come. No, uh, you know, can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. And then he sets forth the subject of election later. Um, there's been a, a parable told of, you know, of a man laboring up a hill with sin and condemnation. He sees a door of salvation ahead of him, and it's written, whosoever will, uh, will may come, whosoever will may come. He rejoices as he enters and his burden is rolled away. Once inside the gateway of salvation, he looks up on the inside of the arch and discovers the words chosen in him before the foundation of the world. What a glorious truth to discover after one has found the peace of sins forgiven as he has placed his faith in the redeeming sacrifice of Jesus Christ that once he saves, once he's accepted, he learns that he was chosen in him before the foundation of the world. Again, this goes back to the foreknowledge of God. Cannot You just cannot eliminate that from this subject at any place. There's nothing we can do to eliminate the foreknowledge of God from the importance and the intertwining of itself into the doctrine and teaching of election. Without that, you, you get error. Um, don't let anything hinder... With, with regard to the doctrine of election, hinder the preaching of the gospel to all mankind. The Great Commission still obligates the church of Jesus Christ go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. I say, quite frankly, with the uh, unconditional election, you know, hardcore Calvinism, you know, irresistible grace. That's one of the, uh, that the tulip. I don't remember, I don't remember all the things of the tulip, um, but one of them is, um, irres the eye is irresistible grace. Well, I guess you was the unconditional election or something, and you know the T and the L and <clears throat> all those things. But we, see, if, quite frankly, if there was irresistible grace, people were selected. They're, they're, they had no choice in the matter. They were going to get saved, and they were going to go to hell. There was nothing to be done. There would be no need of preaching the gospel. It would be pointless to preach the gospel. There would be no need to do it. Because you could go ahead and preach all day. And that person, he's going to get saved or he's not going to get saved. And there ain't nothing nobody can do about it. And you're sharing the truth with him or the gospel with him. wouldn't matter because God had already selected him. See? It, you know, have you got the tulips? Mm -hmm. Okay. Total depravity. Total depravity, man, is totally deprived. An unconditional election. An unconditional election. We've already dealt with that tonight. Limited atonement. Limited atonement. You know, limited atonement meaning it was only for those who he elected. Mm -hmm. Irresistible grace. Irresistible grace. And the perseverance of the saints. Perseverance of the saints. Now, total depravity, man without Christ, is totally depraved. The saints are to persevere. Everything in between is wrong. Okay, so TP, not toilet paper. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. But um, Jesse, I froze up. No, I didn't. Okay, I, I froze. Yeah, so the, the U, L, and I are all error. And you got people going around teaching the tulip, tulip, tulip. You know, teaching that extreme uh, Calvinism of um, you know, unconditional election, uh, limited atonement, 
and irresistible grace. Those three aspects of the tulip are wrong. So you don't have a flower in that, that teaching. It's error. Yeah. So. Toilet tissue. Huh? You have a toilet tissue. Yeah, my, wife, my daughter says you have toilet tissue. <laughs> okay. Toilet paper. Okay. All right. So, well, I guess that's what you got when, when <laughs> doctrines are extreme error. Okay. <laughs> So don't let anything about you know, studying this subject of election stop you from your number one call and your number one purpose and your number one mission to go preach Jesus. <coughs> Again, if, the, if that, that, the tulip was true and that teaching were true, um, there'd be no need in us preaching. It would just be, it would be pointless. We would just be going out and doing it just to be doing it. Because it means nothing. No point in evangelism. Do I know? No point in evangelism. There's no, there would be, yes, no point in evangelism. Okay. Let's, let's finish it up here. We're going to finish this up right now for the night. And we're, we're next week we'll pick up with uh, repentance. Part of the subject of repentance. Election being a doctrine holy of God's sovereignty must be followed by those steps towards the personal experience of salvation which are required of the sinner. These are repentance and faith. Each of these will be considered uh, next week and the following weeks as we get into these subjects of repentance and faith. Repentance and faith. Repentance and faith. Okay? And so we've laid out election. It is a, it is a doctrine wholly of God's sovereignty. But it is followed by the steps towards a personal experience of salvation, which are required of the sinner. They are repentance and faith. Each of these we'll cover in, in depth. We'll get into repentance and then we'll get into faith and their aspect and their role in election in, in our life with Christ. Amen? Hallelujah. Praise God. Well, we, look, we apologize tonight for getting started late. Um, the, um, the, the, we just don't know what's going on with the internet. Um, apparently Spectrum is having issues uh, all over. And uh, we're having issues here. Um, my, uh, my daughter was having issues at her house. It's not connecting corrupt properly. Um, it may just be because there's so many people on the internet trying to find out what's going on in the world. And, um, but, so we apologize. But, um, you know, we'll be back and, um, you know, get this all set up, get rolling, and uh, praise the Lord. So next time we're together, we're going to cover the subject of, of, of repentance and relationship to election. And then as we get through that, well, then we'll cover elect, uh, faith and relationship to election. And we'll keep teaching on uh, spiritology, you know, soter soteriology of uh, the study of salvation. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Um, we just want you to know that we love you. God bless you. And I uh, want to give you these words from 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Hallelujah. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. God bless you. We love you. We'll see you next time here at Faith and Victory Church Online. Until then, be blessed.